All right, we are here. All right, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you are. This is Kurt Barone. And Bill Podzis. And we're here for another edition of File Law Roundup, uh, this time for September 25th of 2023. Bill, go ahead. Let's get into that first case there. Well, our first one comes from across the pond from London, England, where we see a 32-year-old male firefighter uh, accused of secretly filming female colleagues while they were in a shower. And according to the news, we don't have the complaint on this, so we're kind of at a disadvantage. We know that the firefighter has been suspended from the department and that the female employees uh, that have been involved are placed on leave until this thing gets sorted out. It's, it's sad that this is happening. It really is. And yeah, and it's... It's not unique to, to the UK. It, you know what? It's not unique to the fire service in general, but it's not unique to the UK. We've got, I've got a couple of dozen cases from some of which from some very large fire departments really? um, you, with very, very similar uh, fact patterns. Uh, one unusual thing is this guy apparently had uh, some sort of a uh, interest in young, uh, young girls under the age of 13. Um, which I guess you can be a voyeur. I, I guess, you know, you, you can have a cold and appendicitis at the same time. So I guess, you know, you can be, you can be a voyeur and you can be a, uh, you know, a, a pedophile, I guess, or I guess they call the thebophile. Unfortunately, uh, I, I couldn't find much online. All, all the stories were just repetitions of the previous one. Sure. So there were really no new details on this but yeah you're absolutely right there's obviously two different things going on here yeah yeah it's uh it, it's not that and i think it's 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 you know is it is it critical no but i mean it's interesting to know that they're you know this the same condition that causes somebody to be a vo go you know get excitement from being a voyeur is not the same as uh someone who's interested in 13 year old girls but you know coincidentally this guy apparently had an interest in both so well, to what extent um, is what you're presently studying in forensic psychology to what mm -hmm. uh, what kind of an insight does that give you here? Well, well that's that's said. what led me to believe that he's got two different things going on. It's not it doesn't you know, typically you don't it, it's an entirely different um, engine that's driving his needs for those two things. So uh, typically you see, you know, somebody who's just strictly a voyeur and then you see someone who's strictly right. a thebophile. Um, you don't see, and I'm assuming that it could be a pedophile, but there's these different categories of uh, of uh, pedophiles. So, but um, those who would go after a, a post pubescent uh, person would be considered to be a thebophile. So, under the big umbrella of pedophile, but you know, a couple of interesting things about this. One is that. Um, they didn't identify him in the, in the paper. And I guess I'm assuming that's a British or an English, um, you know, approach here, here, the, the guy's name would be plastered all over oh, the, absolutely. the front pages. So, you know, the question that jumped into my mind is what's he doing with the images? Yeah. You know, is, is this for his own purposes or is he disseminating this information? You mm -hmm. know? Obviously, just the uh, the camera alone, at least in New York, would be a, a felony for unlawful surveillance. Mm -hmm. But once you get into the dissemination, especially when we're looking at different ages here, you know, are we looking at child pornography? You know, just how how far is this or how uh, how big is the potential for this thing to go? Yeah. Yeah. It's, well, it's not the first case. It won't be the last case, but it's something that, um, you know, like law enforcement, fire, we tend to have each other's back. And I think we've all got a point where we're saying, you know what, when I become aware of certain behaviors, um, you know, I have your back, but I can't have your back at this point. And I think, well, folks are going to be aware of the types of things. Like when you are aware that somebody has a propensity to secretly record, um, you know, that's a, that's a concern. Uh, you know, this isn't a prank. Um, right. You know, we're you not know. talking about compounding a scratch out of a fire truck. <laughs> I don't know anything about it. The other thing that I noticed here is uh, what was repeated in the various news accounts was 
the statement that he was the last guy you'd expect, the last guy you'd expect. So what's the message there? Yeah. I mean, obviously this is a, could be a huge black guy or would be a huge black guy to any organization in which this happens, you know, but when you think about the volunteer agencies that are out there doing their boot drives and Mm -hmm. pancake breakfasts, you know, one incident like this and you know, the, the community is just going to shut you off. Yeah, no, for sure. And, you know, Especially one of the, guys, one of the, one of the mm-hmm. other realities of our culture is that we tend to give a free pass to high performers. We tend to over scrutinize low performers. And that's one of the things that gets us in trouble that, um, you know, we, we have somebody, maybe this guy's a terrific firefighter. I don't know if he's an officer. The, the case is one, one, unique thing about the cases I've got in my database and I didn't run the numbers. I'm guessing off the top of my head, probably got 30 to 40 cases in my database. Really? 90% of those cases are officers that are doing it. The officers okay. are doing it to subordinate females. Um, so I, I, again, they didn't identify his rank. They just identified him as a firefighter, but uh, right. No, no. at any well, rate, just, you know, it underscores the need for vigilance. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And again, we've got to have each other's back, but there's got to be a got to be a point. And, I, you know, you got to think that at some point um, folks uh, folks may have been suspicious about it. Uh, who knows? Who knows? But, uh, right, but I think we've got to be vigilant, like you said. But the technology now is so small. You can hide these things almost anywhere. You could have the best supervisors in the world and they could legitimately not know. Yeah, you know, and and voyeurism is not new by any by any stretch. But uh, prior to the sort of the digital age, it was it was relatively difficult uh, for people other than, you know, drilling a hole in a wall or trying to trying to look through uh, some sort of a crack or, or whatever it may be. Technology today makes it so much easier. So you know, but just just go back 30 years. How big was a video camera 30 years ago? Yeah, I know. You know, just for, just for home use, exactly. <laughs> right. We're both on your shoulder, same, right? Both at the exact same time. <laughs> and and now, you know, well, I, I could have a pen yeah. camera, yeah. and you don't even know. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, next case is uh, is is kind of troubling, and again, it's not the first time we've seen cases like this, but out of Washington State, where we have a uh, um, actually an older recruit. He was 41 and was a police officer. I think he might have been a deputy sheriff, I think uh, was his official title, but a member of law enforcement, uh, African-American who uh, decides to become a firefighter. Hats off to him for that. Um, But apparently during the uh, academy, uh, during rope class, uh, during a break, uh, one of the firefighters, you know, tied a noose and slipped the noose over his head and then tightened it around his neck. Uh, as he was on the phone with his wife and um y- you know i mean a noose is a fairly intricate knot uh and uh, you know it's it's one that you know when you're working with ropes uh it you know it's 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 an interesting in, in terms of all the things but it's just it's such a symbol today of hate um and the historical connection and i'm not sure we do enough um it, I don't think we do enough to emphasize that uh, in our academies. Um, it, it just keeps coming up and it keeps coming up and it keeps coming up. Um, you know, I would say, you know, we don't go more than a month or two without some sort of a noose related case coming up. Uh, Which really boggles my mind. It, it, you, it really does. In, in the year 2023, this is yeah. still happening. You know, you have to at least consider that the alleged the perpetrator is somebody that put time and effort into getting where they are now. Mm-hmm. Uh, presumably, they studied for an entrance exam, etc. Why on earth would you be throwing this away? You didn't just crawl out from under a rock. You didn't just step out of a spaceship. You, you know, you can't. We can't expect the departments to have to teach you every single thing. Yeah. You know, you you have to at some point you're walking in there as an adult. You're responsible for your conduct. Yeah. And well, this and is, then uh, the allegation. The I know. I know. it. I know. It. And again, it's not the only one. And um, they just they just keep happening. And uh, at any rate, the department um, didn't 
didn't handle the investigation apparently the way that the uh, firefighter felt the recruit felt it should have and he ended up uh, apparently uh, withdrawing from the academy uh, i'm not sure if he went back and became a police officer but he he ended up withdrawing from the academy and uh, felt that the department um did, first of all, didn't properly handle it. They tried to kind of keep it out of the media, keep it off the front page. They allowed the uh, the man, they didn't say uh, resign, but they said separate. Uh, but he was allowed to separate without any discipline. And also, apparently, there was some assurance given to the perpetrator that uh, the department would not bring this up uh, in a future um, reference situation. Yeah, like check from the department. And apparently the department at the time was trying to figure out uh, a way to get uh, to increase the tax levy. So they were very concerned about keeping this off the, the front page. And they issued what the complaint uh, characterizes as a gag order, uh, not to discuss it, not to not to talk about it, which, according to the the recruit, prevented him from reporting it to the police or really reporting it to anyone. And so he ended up uh, resigning. And why that's important is that his lawsuit alleges certainly race discrimination and um, several other uh, constitutional issues, but um, a First Amendment issue that you know you uh, that gag order constituted a, a restraint on his First Amendment right uh, to report it. Um, obstruction of justice. Um, we'd have to get into the details of whether or not obstruction of justice actually occurred conspiracy you know uh Maybe. certainly hate crime i think the the act of placing the noose around his neck would i think well you're the you're the the expert there what do you what do you well, think about? you know in new york this doesn't rise to the level of, level of an assault it doesn't because to have an assault is does not in new york criminally you have to have an injury you either really? have to have a physical injury or a serious physical injury. Without that, you have no assault. Really? Wow. So the yeah. best you've got here, and I hate to say the best you've got, um, is aggravated harassment, uh, which is only a misdemeanor because it's an act of harassment uh, based upon race. So it wouldn't be, see, in Rhode Island, an assault can be putting somebody in apprehension of uh, of a contact so you take a swing at somebody even if you don't make contact um that that would be an assault here and then battery would be yeah. actual actual contact um, now, i've had this argument with the uh, with adas about charging attempted assault mm -hmm. and you know i've had people tell me well there's no such thing but if i take a louisville slugger and i take a nice you know <laughs> round shot at your, your head and, and you're an ex-boxer and you duck yeah. and weave and, and i miss you well, yeah. did I not try to get you? Yeah. Of course I did. So I've yeah. got, I, in my mind, I've got a good solid attempt at assault, but I know yeah. other people that, that won't go for it. Hmm. But you could try to charge here um, reckless endangerment, mm -hmm. which is creating the risk of serious physical injury. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we're talking civil here. The criminal side is now, one thing. The was he the civil no, no, side, know, uh, certainly, and I, I, I'm assuming the hate crime would be something under state law. Um, have to go right. through the complaint to but take the a look. only way under New York. I'm sorry, the, the only way under New York law that you'd get this to a hate crime would be charging reckless, reckless endangerment, because our hate crime statute lists what qualifies and what does not, mm -hmm. and that aggravated harassment does not because. It, it's already based on race to begin with. So that just stays where it is. Um, you may be able to charge a menacing on this, but that, again, would not uh, be one that could be elevated to a hate crime. That leaves you with a reckless endangerment, and that leaves you with ha having to prove that the other firefighter created a substantial risk of serious physical injury. So there's a lot of elements in there that need to be proven. I'm just looking at the uh, the complaint and uh, paragraph. It's the uh, complaint, uh, I guess, is numbered 12 uh, called hate crime. And it's based on a, uh, on a Washington statute. But it the way it's pled, it sounds like they're using the language of the statute. It says uh, he, that the perpetrator maliciously and intentionally 
cause physical injury to the plaintiff or threaten the plaintiff because of a perception of the plaintiff's race or color. So right. there's probably a little uh, a little less uh, burdensome than the, the New York standard. So and it's going to vary state to state, obviously. Mm -hmm. The, the sad part is when you read in the complaint the um, the outtakes from his evaluations from the police department, yeah, from when he was in the sheriff's office. And the one that really struck me was, I would trust him with my life and the life of my family. Now, to hear that as a firefighter or a cop, to have somebody say that about you, the yeah. praise doesn't get much higher. Yeah, it really doesn't. And if that's the person that you've now lost, yeah, you know, to public service what an incredible shame that is yeah you know and, and when you look at some of the other comments in there about how he, his dedication his compassion his his integrity his honesty you know this is the guy you want to be working with this is the right. guy you want to be you know either sitting in a radio car with or, or crawling down that smoke-filled hallway with yeah yeah for sure so yeah well he's got a bunch of bunch of civil claims here that apparently as best i could tell there were no criminal charges brought against the perpetrator and, uh, you know, he's going to try to get his day in court here. The, the victim is going to try to get his day in court here on the civil counts. Uh, and I, like you said, it's really unfortunate if he, you know, was a terrific uh, prospect. Um, you know, the department's lost him. And, uh, you know, hopefully he got back uh, into his prior career. Um, I would assume that that would, you know, once you get your certification there um, as a police officer, it's, it's, you know, you've been through the academy, he's worked as a police officer. Uh, I'm sure hopefully you can get back there somewhere. So the next case we've got uh, is this one is troubling for me. It, it comes out of the um, Atlanta Fire Department. Uh, and uh, I, I say it's troubling because I'm familiar with Ad Atlanta's internal affairs folks, um, and they're very well right. trained. They're very skilled. Um, they have professional investigators um, who handle these types of complaints. Uh, but the allegation is uh, here that a female recruit, and in, I'm going to do a lot of speculating here because um, the complaint doesn't give us all the details, but uh, she started the academy in August of 22, and um, in the February of 23 now, she's still in the academy. So I'm, I'm assuming they're done with the fire part of it. She's in the EMS part of the academy, and they've got a, uh, a chief who's in his 70s, which I, I think is a little bit unusual. Folks still, still work in, in their 70s in a major metro fire department uh who's been with the department for decades uh apparently took some sort of a uh romantic or sexual interest in her and um did some um you know made some inappropriate comments um you know touched her inappropriately made, made her feel uncomfortable um and then she complained and the complaints went nowhere and the reason reason I say that is I know the folks in Atlanta and um, they don't look the other way at, um, you know, this kind of misconduct. Um, so it, it just it, it's I don't know when I read it, I was just a little bit. Well, thinking there's something more to I'm this always at a disadvantage with these. We've never got the full story. I, I know it. I know it. But uh, certainly the one comment that is is in the headlines and and. You, you hate to kind of because it's once you once you get to this point and you put a certain connotation on this comment, then, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's very hard to defend. But um, the, the the chief is reported to have said in a classroom in front of other people, I want to put icing all over you. Um, and that and I believe in front of another officer, too. Exactly. And everyone laughed. And, uh, you know, it, Again, she she ended up uh, leaving the academy. She she felt like she needed some leaves. Now, here's the other side of this. She she suffered some sort of a panic attack, uh, which um, you know that 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 can be caused by a lot of things, but certainly it could be caused by being sexually harassed and yeah. sexually assaulted and and treated the way that she had. She suffered a panic attack. She went for medical uh, evaluation. They recommended she take two weeks off. Uh, then um, she sought an additional six weeks of leave uh, under the Family Medical Leave Act, 
and that at that point she was terminated. Now, I thought it was interesting, and it's unfortunate Brad's not here too, because Brad has been doing a class on uh, the FMLA. Um, but I think it's interesting that they raised the FMLA. You have to be employed by the same employer for 12 months <laughs> before right. you're plus eligible. A minimum, I'm sorry. Plus a minimum number of hours. Yeah, a, hours. absolutely. Yeah. So I think she would have been over the hours, but she certainly wasn't over the 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 the, the year. Uh, so why she would seek leave under the Family Medical Leave Act. And again, I, I, I don't know if Georgia has um, a sort of a state law statute that's the equivalent of the FMLA. Here in Rhode Island, we do, but it still requires that you have been employed for a year. Um, but she sought leave under the FMLA and then they washed her out. Well, if she's still in the academy, I mean, you can't take eight weeks off and complete the academy. I mean, right. <laughs> you know? I mean, and unless something so, catastrophic has happened, you broke your leg in a car crash or something. But even yeah, there, well, then we'll, we'll see in the next gotta, academy. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You got to get into the next class. You know, but I mean, you can't miss uh, eight weeks. And uh, again, I think it's it's really a long um, training period because if she started in August of 22, she wasn't terminated until June. And that's when she sought the leave. And apparently there's some question that if they had given her the leave, it would have gotten her to the one year. Uh, which, uh, you know, they, bottom line is I think it, the, the telling uh, point of this complaint is that they did not include an FMLA count in the complaint. So the attorney right. realized there was no FMLA claim here, but certainly alleging uh, sexual harassment. Um, there was no race discrimination claim here. Uh, both, both of the uh, individuals involved in this were African-American. So uh, that there, there was no uh, race claim uh, included. It was just strictly a sexual harassment claim. So, and one count at that. Certainly an uncomfortable situation to be in there if you're another recruit or the other officer that was there. Yeah. You know, I, um, I, I was lecturing uh, last week um, to the um, North American Fire Training Directors Association. And uh, one of the points we looked at the data, one of the most likely ways a fire department is going to be sued is sexual harassment followed by race discrimination. And we talked about the, the length of time that we train our trainers to be good trainers. And we don't put much of an emphasis on the HR aspect of dealing with, you know, some of the HR issues. We, we want them proficient in training uh, our firefighters, whether it's EMS, ventilation, hose, ladders, you know, forcible entry. We want them proficient there. But the HR part of it is where we're having a problem. And, you know, just another case to kind of put an exclamation point on that, that uh, handling some of these, um, handling some of these types of issues. And, you know, what do you do when you have somebody who is a senior instructor? He's been there, you know, if he's in his 70s and he started in his 20s, he's been there, you know, 50 years or so. Um, you know, how do you? But you've talked about this before with your own brother and the mm -hmm. training that he went through in the military yeah. to be an instructor. Yeah. And it's not necessarily being you got to be technically competent in your skills. But there's all these other things that you need to be in. You know, certainly you don't want to be putting somebody through a, a drill yard and then they collapse because, you know, you didn't give them enough breaks. It's too hot. You didn't give them enough water. And, you, you know, you have that part. But you have the HR part, which I think is another area where we just, you know, as long as you're a 1041 instructor and you're a good firefighter, you're good to teach. And I, I think this. You know, there's another there's but, another part to it. But knowing a skill and being able to teach that skill are two different things. Yeah, absolutely. And like you said, uh, like, again, to mention your brother, you you can't just watch Full Metal Jacket and figure, OK, this is how I'm going to treat my recruits the way the, the DI does and, you know, take that approach. It, it doesn't work. You know, you, you need to be taught to instruct. And I know in, in the police department, uh, industrial uh, instructor development school, what we call IDS, was a very sought after uh, mm -hmm. program to, to, to be sent to. And how long How long was that? That was three weeks. Three weeks. And, and, and did you get into the HR part of things? 
did they did they go over that at that point no i'm going back over 20 years right uh, when i went through it and it was actually run through the local community college it was a three college credit course mm -hmm. um, and it was more about it, lesson plans and drawing up your lesson plans and the environment to teach in mm -hmm. you know the, the barriers to instruction uh, you know how people learn things like that and it really was a it's a very intense class and you make on your very first day you have to make a presentation you make presentations every day almost and you're videotaped and i'm dating myself with videotape but then the court the, the um the class critiques you critique everybody else in the, in the class right, right. on your performance and a lot of it is being taught to think on your feet and simple things like having two copies of everything in case you drop one on the floor you don't have to bend over and pick it all up you know um and and i see a lot of that is missing how many times have you seen officers try to conduct a, a class next to a fire engine that's running and nobody can hear a thing yeah well why can't we just turn it off mm -hmm. you know simple simple things so yeah, we have we, we have some pretty good um programs on um operational training like like exactly like you suggest our 1041 level one level two uh programs um but I think like, I guess what concerns me here is that Lieutenant, and I've, I've got to believe there are other people, other instructors in the room when this particular chief made some of the comments and that have they been trained that look, whether the person's a, an admiral, a, a five-star general, a five bugle fire chief, um, when things like that, there needs to be some sort of way of, um, reeling the instructor in and holding them accountable for if you're that lieutenant at that moment your career flashes before your eyes because it's about to go bye-bye and like you said it doesn't matter if that person's an admiral you need to yeah. be able to say to him uh, can we speak outside immediately <laughs> you know you've got a room full of witnesses yeah. potentially yeah you're on stage right you know, uh, you know what, like if, if it was one on one comments, now there was some of the allegations here were one on one that were arguably off duty. OK, but um, the things that took place in the classroom, uh, assuming that the um, the allegations were corroborated, uh, that they're, they're troubling. And with the icing on icing all over you being probably the, the most, uh, mm -hmm. you know, damning. Um, but again um you know are the are the instructors um aware of the consequences that are there any consequences um have they been trained in how to handle these types of things because i'll tell you it's tough as a as a junior officer to call to task well, somebody you've got such a disparity in rank you've got a lieutenant <laughs> you've got a, a senior chief yeah. we don't know how many bugles he's got on his collar but you've got a problem right there. How comfortable is that lieutenant going to be saying, hey, chief, we have to talk, but yeah. take it one step further. Now you're dealing with recruits. Mm -hmm. you, you've got such a huge gap now between a recruit and a chief. Yeah. What person? Oh, yeah. What, what recourse yeah. does that person have? Right. Absolutely. You know, and even the worst instructor in the world is going to be viewed as, as a god by mm -hmm. a new recruit until a recruit figures out this person doesn't know what they're doing. You know, yeah. you've got that disparity that, that can't be ignored. Yeah. Well, it's changed. The bottom line of a, yeah. in all of this is it's changed. It's changed in a fire service. It's changed in a police service. And, and the approach has to be different. Certainly. Well, what, again, getting back to something I said a little earlier as well, um, the fact that she she made the complaint and neither the head of the academy or the HR person that she spoke to did anything is is not. It, not consistent with the Atlanta Fire Department that I know. I've got friends that work there. I've I've done training with a lot of their investigators, and that's that is not consistent with how um, they tend to operate. I find it hard to believe that any HR person would hang up on an employee calling with a complaint. Right. You know, worst especially case a complaint is, like this. Yeah. Right. I mean, worst case yeah. scenario is I can't talk to you right now. Give me a phone number. I'll call you back in twenty minutes. Right. But so. I find it really hard to believe that it would be ignored completely. Yeah, uh, agreed. But again, um, we only last two, the story. Yeah, last two cases uh, we've got. And I'm gonna I'm gonna put them up. Well, I'll, I'm gonna put them up just because uh, it'll 
that'll facilitate the discussion here. But we've got two cases from the Topeka, Kansas, both filed, uh, I believe, last week. Uh, and let me get it up here. Whoops. And move my going to move my stuff around here. But uh, but here we go. Um, this is the first one that I covered. I think the other one might have actually been filed first, but uh, it's a Topeka, Kansas uh, captain um, who is alleging uh, race discrimination, disability discrimination, retaliation, and violations of the FMLA. And uh, you can see some of the uh, allegations in the in the window there. Uh, he's African American. He's got leukemia. Um, had been a firefighter for a number of years, um, you know, began working in 94, made captain in uh, August of 2015. And um, he apparently, I guess he got sick in, uh, or was diagnosed in 2018, uh, was looking for some positions that would accommodate his uh, medical condition. And um, I guess he wasn't able to get any of those. He also asked to uh, to go on light duty, which they they did they did put him in a light duty position, but they wouldn't let him get into uh, the light duty positions that he wanted. And he was hoping to stay until age sixty. But uh, he used the expression "ride the car," which I'm assume is uh, act as a battalion chief, and uh, that was apparently denied. I'm not I'm not sure why that was, but. Um, you know, they Apparently he's missing a class. They said he had to have the uh, incident safety officer class. Right. That's what they said. But then they allowed apparently a, a, a white captain uh, to ride. Uh, but again, I don't know if we're talking apples to apples here uh, because uh, he, he was requesting to go there permanent or permanently or semi permanently. And um, the white battalion chief was just there for one day. So. Uh, again, you know, when you're looking for, like, if there's a battalion chief that's off for a long period of time and they're putting somebody in that acting spot, that's one thing. If you just, because somebody called in sick, we need somebody for the day, that's a different thing. So again, I don't know if we're, we're apples to apples here, but that's, uh, that's one of the things that he's alleging. And, uh, but a lot of that stuff happened, um, I think outside of the, um, 300 day window for the EEOC. Uh, and uh, for the complaints. And when you're alleging a violation of Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, uh, you've got to, you can only go back 300 days. So a lot of his allegations go back beyond uh, his filing of a, an EEOC complaint. But at any rate, um, in March of 22, there were four division chiefs open. And that's important because you'll see in the next lawsuit that we're going to talk about, we have the exact same fact pattern um and yeah. that that person is alleging gender discrimination because they didn't get the positions but here this captain is alleging race discrimination and also disability discrimination um in that he uh, felt he was qualified for both the fire marshal and the chief of administration and um you know uh they they gave the positions to um someone who was caucasian that uh apparently either didn't have the same qualifications or uh, didn't even put in for the position. I think the fire marshal was uh, given to someone who um, uh, hadn't been a captain for two years. And then the chief of administration ended up going to someone who uh, didn't even put in for it. <laughs> right. It says he wasn't a captain with Topeka, which leads me to question if he was a supervisor someplace else. Ah, could be. Yeah, could be. You know, so, could he lateral in? Yeah. So uh, again, um, race, race discrimination, uh, uh, disability discrimination, retaliation, and uh, alleging a violation of the Family Medical Leave Act. So, uh, so that's sort of case number one. And then case number two is a female uh, captain with the Topeka, Kansas Fire Department, who's alleging that it was gender discrimination for her not to have gotten one of those four positions. Um, and I think, yeah, she was going for the same, same two, the chief of administration and chief and fire yeah, was, she, was she going for chief of administration or the inspection? Uh, position? Yeah. Plaintiff. Yeah. This is, this is uh, her allegations. Uh, plaintiff applied for both the chief of administration and the fire marshal. Yeah, the fire marshal. There you go. Yeah. So they were both going for the same position. 
And, um, you know, she had been around for 24 years and had been yeah. a captain for more than two years. So uh, she interviewed for both positions um, and um, a white male was offered the fire marshal position uh, and he did not meet the requirements for that position. And then um, the uh, chief of administration was offered to a person who did not even apply for the position. That's that's going to be tough when you, <laughs> you know, you're applying for something and they they not only don't give it to you, but they they must have went looking for someone. <laughs> they tapped them on the shoulder and said, guess what? <laughs> you know, um, so at any rate, now, here's the, the, the interesting thing, both the same department two people vying for the same positions, they don't get them. One claims it's race discrimination and, and disability discrimination. The other claims is gender discrimination. And, and here's the incredible point. The fire department could lose both of these, right? Absolutely. Very easily, I think, too. I mean, you can't, you know, it's not necessarily one's going to win or the other. They both could lose as well. I mean, that's, that's, that's another strong possibility here, but... Uh, unfortunate yeah so you know you've got two people with a lot of experience on a job yeah yeah so so again we don't know uh you know uh there, i'm sure there's a lot more um you know going on with both of these uh you know both of these cases but uh you know only so much makes it into the complaint and uh, we, that's what we're limited to so. but you don't want to lose that institutional knowledge yeah well you know, I mean, I, the, the one captain who's dealing with the leukemia, I can understand that's going to limit his ability, I would assume, to go out in the street and function, you know, as a firefighter. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean he can't do other things. Well, he yeah, and he ended up resigning, I believe, or taking an early retirement. Um, where, where did my thing go? Yeah, but uh, yeah, he ended up taking an early retirement. but. Um, the interesting thing, he, he had leukemia in 2018, but he's alleging that it was race discrimination in 2022. You know, you, you know, it's it's one thing if you've, um, you, you know, you have a have a condition more recent, and then that's the reason why. But this, you know, he apparently was able to function, I guess, in a light duty capacity uh, for four years anyway, uh, and uh, you know. Opted to opted to resign. So, I don't know. Any final thoughts there on either of the the Topeka cases? No, no. Like I said, it's just a shame when you've got institutional knowledge like this, you want to use it. You know, when I was in a training unit, we would see guys take their retirement and they'd leave, and we would often talk about how, how we wish we could keep that guy as a civilian uh, instructor. Mm. because he knows so much mm -hmm. and where are people going to learn that yeah well you replace you replace somebody with 25 years with zero right <laughs> and um you know you got maybe somebody who's who's younger and more healthier maybe a little bit more energy but no institutional knowledge right i mean no. you both we've both seen plenty of people leave the job that you couldn't use it instruct as an instructor right. yeah. you couldn't right. and there were others that were, were wonderful i mean people that i'm sure you learned from people i learned from absolutely and you wish you could keep them i mean they don't necessarily have to function as a firefighter anymore or as a police officer anymore mm -hmm. but they can still pass on what they know yeah and i i really think that would be a a viable thing mm -hmm. you know maybe it's a you can create another civil service title and get another couple of years in their pension at a lower grade. Maybe it wouldn't make a matter make a difference anymore at that point. Who knows? Um, mm -hmm. It's just something to think about. Yeah. You know, I had a friend of mine, a uh, commissioned officer, and he was, uh, he was supervising investigations and he got diagnosed with uh, a, a serious illness that limited his mobility, but he could still do all the office work. Mm -hmm. He could still look at all the photographs and read all the reports and make the phone calls and you know you don't necessarily have to be boots on the ground yeah and well, think, unfortunately you know, he was forced out i think that's it that's an important distinction between law enforcement and fire because um you know fire most of our resources 
are in the street. Right. Um, there's not a lot back. There's fire prevention. There's some headquarters staff, but most of our resources are in the street. Whereas I think law enforcement's more maybe 60, 40, maybe 50, 50, depending on the organization. And you need those people um, that are going to handle the, the things in the office. Um, and the fire department can only afford to have so many right. uh, people in late, in late duty right. positions. Yeah. The police yeah. department's the same way. And of course, it's going to depend on the size of the agency. Right. Right. But, you know, you the smaller know. agencies just don't have those other positions. You know, like we saw last week, they had a quartermaster and an assistant quartermaster. Yeah. Well, how many of those positions are there? Well, I think those were collateral positions. So these are folks that are on the line that in addition to their line responsibilities are also serving as quartermaster. So it's not a full time, full time okay. type of a gig. Yeah. But I, I know um, from my experience, a lot of our EMS folks that are doing five or 6,000 runs a year, um, you know, that's that's fun maybe when you're a brand new paramedic for a few years, but you very quickly get burnt out. And then, um, again, I'm speaking just from my own experience, these folks are looking for, for places to hide. And that's, what, that's well, what we would call it, but they're looking for places to hide, whether it's the training division or the EMS office, but- hey, I they, the training division i wasn't hiding yeah <laughs> yeah well I, and i don't mean to suggest everybody in the training division or everybody in the headquarters ems offices either but point being that the job beats you up and i'm sure like a police officer oh. the job beats you up and but there's from the from the um the get the job done perspective the shift commander's perspective we need bodies in each of those seats and I can't, have, I can't have 10 burnt out medics at the training division throwing paper airplanes at each other. Um, you know, I, I need medics on the rigs. <laughs> There's a big so, difference in, in, in these jobs between being 25 years of age and 35 years of age and 45 years of age. And some people who are still there at 55 years of age. God bless them. <laughs> you know, doing a shift work, you know, gets harder and harder and harder as you get older. Yeah. I know it. I know it. So, all right, Bill. Well, thank you once again, once thank again you. for for bailing me out here and giving me a hand on a Monday afternoon. I really appreciate, I appreciate it. it. Yep. And that's going to do it for another edition of File or Roundup.